Welcome to the Startup Grind. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our friend, Director Michelle Lee. How's it going, Director? Great. Thank you for that very warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Awesome. So um, thank you for coming out. Uh, when I first heard about you, it was actually at South by Southwest, and I actually witnessed you getting inducted, uh, sworn oh, you in. you were there. I was there. Oh, my. With 3,000 other people. So she's pretty <laughs> badass, guys. Like, <laughs> she's amazing. Actually, if I could, that was the first time an Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property was sworn in on the stage by South by Southwest. And usually it happens under these closed rooms. And so we thought, why not? All the innovators are there. I'm there to serve the innovators. So why shouldn't I be sworn in there? So that's how we chose that. Right. And it was the Secretary of Commerce, right? Secretary Pritzker. Penny Pritzker, Penny right. Pritzker, yeah. Absolutely. That was amazing. Um, so we always like to start off uh, on a personal note. So where are you born? Where are you raised? Uh, what did your parents do? And then perhaps maybe talk about um, what's the first program that you were proud of writing? So let's start with you. Okay. Well, so I was born and raised in the Silicon Valley. Um, I grew up on a street where all the dads, and back then it was dads, were engineers. And this was in the time when Silicon Valley was mainly silicon. Not, not software, not com personal computers, not the internet, not mobile phones, but silicon. And I can remember my dad had this workshop in, this gar in our garage. We had like resistors and transistors and circuit diagrams, and he built stuff. And I watched it, and I helped him install the burglar alarm in our house, and I helped him build the TV that sat in our living room, and as a young girl, I built a handheld radio, and it was just, I thought that's what everybody did. I mean, don't, isn't that what all girls do <laughs> at that age? So it was just what I grew up with, and I loved creating things, making things, and I guess that was the first spark, and oftentimes those dads that were engineers, right, it was very common for them to come up with an invention, to obtain a patent, to get venture capital funding, and um, some of those companies succeeded, some did not, but a few that did really revolutionized the world and the way in which we live. So I thought, there is nothing cooler than to be doing startup work and inventing things and creating things and making products and bringing them to the marketplace. So that was what I grew up with, and I always wanted to be a part of the innovation, uh, you know, innovation. So, like, so when did you start coding? Like, did you, what's, what was your first Hello World? What language was it in? Yeah, yeah. so um, I was coding, I can't, how, how old was I? I mean, this was before there were these programs like Girls Who Code. And my first uh, computer program, I think, was the famous uh, Hello World in C. Uh, followed by the centigrade to Fahrenheit converter. I then got more sophisticated, and then later on, um, I don't know if you all remember this, but um, artificial intelligence, they were trying to make computers seem intelligent, and then there was this program called ELIZA, and it was basically the psychiatrist asking questions, and you give them answers, and they pair it back, and it, it resembles intelligent. That's uh, Siri's father, isn't it? Yes, correct, <laughs> correct. <laughs> and then, so that was the next program, and then eventually for my graduate work, um, I did an AI program that has to do with qualitative analysis of nonlinear system using AI techniques and computer vision and digital signal processing. But that's all I remember about it. That sounds as long as your title, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. um, actually, uh, uh, so I do speak, I do program in more languages than I speak, which is a point of pride for me as I run America's Innovation Agency. So, uh, what are some of the languages? <laughs> oh, now then I have to date myself. That would be too embarrassing. <laughs> uh, okay, sure, no problem. Uh, so, actually, the tidbit of information: um, I heard that you were. This is not. This is not tech related, but I heard you were a uh, a pretty good ballet oh. ballerina. Wait, where yeah. did you get that? Um, um, so yes. Um, well, it is my passion. Okay. I mean, with all the techie, analytical, quantitative things that one does, you have to have an outlet. Yeah. And my creative outlet is that I am passionate about classical ballet. And in fact, I danced for 16 years. And if you want to talk about something that pulls me into a different realm, watching a really good performance of a classical ballet really transforms me into a different world. I, you know, I watch the dancers, and when they land it right, and they jump just right, I'm like, ah, oh, beautiful. If they, if they miss their mark, I'm like, oh, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very hard, um, it's very hard and very demanding uh, physical endeavor, and that's my other passion. Wow! So programming and then ballerina—it's like it's you got to balance, balance the techie and yeah. the fuzzy. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so, a, if you guys are on Twitter, um, hashtag Startup Grind at S U S P T O. Okay. Is there any other Twitter handle? No, I think that's it. Okay. All right. Good. So I wasn't sure if you had any rogue, like, you know, Twitter handle or something. No. no? Good. Okay. Um, so we want to start like uh, with when you were in college, um, you, you mentioned, I mean, I've, I've been reading articles on you, uh, but uh, when you were at the, when you were at MIT, you worked at the artificial intelligence lab. And then, I mean, you were fairly technical um, being from MIT and then you decided to go into law. So like, why, you know, why did you decide to go into law after having a very technical background? So I was well on my way to getting a PhD, and that's actually what I thought I would do when I went to MIT. Um, and then when I was, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and my master's in computer science at MIT, and I was writing my master's thesis. And at the time, there was the Apple versus Microsoft case going on in the courts. And some of you may be too young to remember it, but some of you may remember that. And that was the issue of to what degree and uh, whether the graphical user interface, the trash cans, the scroll bars, and so forth, were protected by copyrights. And there was no answer in the copyright law. I mean, the copyright law was created to protect literary expressions, musical compositions, a whole bunch of other things, but not this user interface, the graphical user interface. So I'm thinking, hmm, there are going to be a lot of really interesting legal questions with no answers in the existing case law, and somebody who understands the technology and the law and could actually help influence it in a positive direction for innovation. Because if intellectual property uh, rights or laws are too strong, you can stifle innovation. If they're too weak, you don't get the innovation. So I thought there was a role to play in terms of striking that right balance of creating right policy. I mean, judges in their court rulings are, in essence, formulating policy, right? So I, I wanted to be a part of that, and that's what I did. Um, so. So after graduating from law school, um, you were in private practice with Google. So I mean, uh, one of the the best you know tech companies in the world. And at the time, I remember you know I think it was like when I was in college, ninety five, ninety six. That's when we started playing with Google. Like I remember because you had the Yahoo search and then you had Google. Um, like. You were helping Google uh, approve some of their patents, right? I mean, how many patents did went through your, your office at Google? I mean, it must have been a lot. So um, I actually, before Google, I did represent a whole bunch of startups. Um, you know, solo inventor walking in the door with an idea in his head um, or her head, not having any funding, not having a business plan, and just kind of helping them through that process. So actually, that was where I did the bulk of my startup work. And I loved working with startups. It was, it was fantastic. Um, like I said, some of them succeeded, some of them did not. But it's just exciting to work with entrepreneurs and, and people who want to really introduce something new into the world. So then around the dot-com uh, bust era. <laughs> dot bomb. Yeah. yeah. Um, there were a lot of search engine companies on the market. I mean, there was AltaVista, Ask Jeeves, Yahoo, Excite, Lycos, Excite uh, at Home, and all these companies. And then there was Google. And and then uh, the, the the then general counsel said, Michelle, why don't you come over to Google? You know, is that what you do? You can come help our company. I thought, why would I do that? <laughs> We're in the middle of the dot-com bust. There are all these search engines out there, but I did like using the search engine. It was, in my mind, better, and I was an early user of the search engine. So I went over and I had lunch, the proverbial, come on over, have lunch, and um, the people were really smart. And I've had the privilege of working with some really bright individuals, but I just sensed that there was something different here. And I thought, oh, I can always go back to my law firm partnership, I think. I think they would take me back. So um, I joined Google when it was relatively young, when I think they only had domestic revenue, when there were not that many product offerings, search ads, and a little bit of a couple others. And um, I mean, the engineers were not fans of patents, generally, as many engineers are not. Um, I understood that because I come from the engineering world, but I also understood how important it was for the company to protect its innovation. And that you know leads to later points in my, in my story. But um, I joined when the company had literally only a handful of issued patents. And I was there uh, for about eight and a half, almost nine years. And by then, Google was in almost every country across the globe. And the products and services were ranged from uh, you know, Gmail to Google Maps to Google Earth to driverless cars to, I mean, it, the list went on and on. And it was a tremendous opportunity to be with a whole 
very, very exciting team, um, really pushing forward the frontiers in ways that nobody ever imagined. And um, in the process, some very cool technology was developed. And by the time I left, we had a lot of patents in the pipeline, but we had uh, over 8,500 patents in the portfolio. And we were also um, uh, you know, heavily involved in mobile, mobile phones and, and Android and a whole bunch of other technologies. So it was an incredible experience. It was one job, but I like to say it was really many jobs because the company really just grew and we went into so many different areas and you were always tested and stretched. And so it was a wonderful experience. Oh, that's going to be my next question. I mean, I'll actually, I'm, I'm going to talk about it a little later on, but like, you know, Google is primarily, I mean, back then was primarily a software company. And so, you know, when you think about like, oh, they got 8,000 patents, like, you know, wow, like, is it even worth to do patents? Now they're a little bit more hardware and, and you know, they're doing all this um, innovative stuff. It makes more sense, but I'll, 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 I'll get to there. But I wanted to go into the U.S. patent office. Like, you had a very stellar, you know, amazing career at Google. I mean, you know, tech, technical folks, they'd be like, I'm, go I'm at Google, and I'm going to stay here for as long as I, I can before I do another startup, right? And so, like, you know, what, you know, you're, what made you want to work for the government? So let, let's let me let's 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 let me describe your title here again: Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of United States Patent and Trademark Office. Could you describe to our audience what what you do? <laughs> let's let's start. That's with a that. good question. Yeah. What do I do with that very long title? Um, so the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property. That means I'm the principal advisor to the president through the Secretary of Commerce on domestic and international intellectual property policy. So that's number one, hat number one. Hat number two is I'm the director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So I'm the chief executive officer of a 13,000 person organization, $3.3 billion budget, whose business it is to um, grant patents and trademarks and also to provide uh, legal rulings on the validity of patents and trademarks, um, and also to provide a lot of, and this will be relevant to all of you, a lot of education and outreach material and content to the innovation community, because the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's mission at the highest level is to promote American innovation through intellectual property rights. So anything that we can do through intellectual property rights to promote the good work, the good inventions that you all do, we're there, and we're, we're, we're in, it's our goal to try to help you achieve that. So that's my title, and, and that's a bit about what I do, and you want to know how I got there from? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, from Google to the government. <laughs> so if you had asked me growing up in the Silicon Valley as a young girl, you know, building my handheld radio with my dad and the TV in our living room, if I ever thought that I would be in Washington, D.C. one day, head of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, I would say no. I, would, I never would have imagined it. I never thought about it. I, I figured I'd be in the Silicon Valley, and, and that's what I did for really almost the entirety of my career. But um, what I came to realize is that what I like to do is I like to help support and be a part of innovation. So whether that's as an engineer, whether that's as a startup lawyer advising startup companies and helping them succeed, or whether that's part as being a part of in-house counsel at a young startup company that, or a young company that grows into a big multinational company that is very innovative, I like to support innovation. And I realize that in the United States, we have this incredible system. We are one of the most innovative societies on this planet at any time in history. And I, it's not by accident. In part, it's because we've got these great financial systems. We have venture capital funding. We have you know, secure sources of financing where you don't actually have to put your own money out to, to bring your dreams and make it a reality. In part, it's because we have laws and so forth that encourage it. But also, I believe it is because we've got an intellectual property system that gives you protection so that you can recoup and re uh, 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 the rewards of your hard work and your investment. And because of that, American society, plus we were just scrappier, we were in a new country, we had to create a new country out of nothing, right? So you're gonna be resourceful and scrappy. So by, by virtue of our tradition, by virtue of our DNA, by virtue of our laws, we are a very innovative society, but you cannot take that for granted. And um, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, and as I mentioned, you had startup companies, and you had these uh, individuals who were creating a lot of economic prosperity for a region. Um, not all of them succeeded, but for those that did, they created a lot of benefits for their communities. And so wanting to be a part of that and wanting to make sure that that persists for generations to come, I think so long as we continue to invent and so long as we continue to maintain our entrepreneurial spirit, 
our country will do just fine. We'll work through a lot of the other issues. But, you know, policies can be too heavy handed. Laws can be too heavy handed uh, or they could be not strong enough. All of that has impacts on innovation. And so having experienced what I experienced from the tech world, from the business world, I wanted to make sure that our society continued to remain innovative. And so in my very small way, with my bit of expertise that I had gathered, I thought, what a better thing to do uh, and to create, to ensure, or try to help ensure that we continue to be innovative and we reward and incentivize the creation of new products and services that are shipped all over the world. And actually there's a, I mean, in the past, you know, actually four or five years, there's been um, a lot of recruiting from Silicon Valley by Obama to come over here. So it's been really amazing. Um, hopefully that continue. <laughs> I think I think personally that the more cross fertilization there is between business world and government, and then similarly government to business world, I think everybody will be better off for it because each one sort of operates in its own silo to some degree, and um, we, our our success is tied together, right? I mean, you don't get one without the other, and they both need each other. Um, but uh, the more business people who end up in the, the the public sector, the more public sector folks who go outside of the Beltway and end up in the the business world, I think every the, everything will work better as a result. And the other thing too is um, I'm um, a child of an immigrant. And this country has been pretty good to my family and myself. And I do feel an obligation to give back and to make sure that our country remains strong for subsequent generations. You had mentioned about the, uh, did you mention about the regional offices by the U.S. Patent Office? Okay, let's talk about the U.S. Patent, uh, the regional offices. Like what, what sort of value, you have four regional offices, right? One in Dallas, Denver, Detroit, and San Jose. Uh, what, what sort of value do you believe these regional offices um, give to our community? especially for innovation. So the United States Patent and Trademark Office has been around since 1790 when President Washington signed the Patent Act into effect. So this office has been in effect since 1790. And for the most part, it's only been located in Washington, D.C. Now, I'm talking to an audience in D.C., but I know there's a listening audience that is much broader. We all know that there's a lot of innovation that goes on outside the DC area. And the US Patent and Trademark Office offers all these incredible services to help support innovation. And I'll, I'll go into that in a moment, but all these incredible resources and services and to fully take advantage of them, it helps to be closer. But some of our most innovative communities are not close to Washington. So for the first time in our country's history, um, we first established the uh, Detroit office, then um, it was, uh, what was next, Denver, Denver. then uh, Silicon Valley, then Dallas. And they're located across each time zone within the continental United States. You've got one on the West Coast. I mean, they don't just service the cities in which they're located. It's the entire region. So Silicon Valley, the whole West Coast region. Um, Dallas, the whole South Central part of the United States. If you're on the East Coast, of course, you've got this location here in Washington, D.C., the Alexandria, Virginia area. And then if you're in the uh, mid the middle part of the country, there's Detroit. So And then Denver, the Rocky Mountain region. So really, it was meant to spread out and um, uh, reach all all make it easier for startups to access the full range of resources because the startups don't have the time, energy, or resources to pay attention of all the policies and programs that may benefit them or to chime in with thoughts and input on policies that will inevitably affect them by monitoring federal register notices. I mean, honestly, you guys got your products to build, you got your products to launch, and uh, you're lucky if you do that in the next feature and hit your um, market window of opportunity. So really being out in the local innovation community is huge. There's really no, there's nothing but upside with those offices. So being able to have seminars and workshops that are for free on how do I file a patent? How do I register for my trademark? What if I think that I might one day sell my product overseas? What do I need to start thinking about? When do I not need to start thinking about that? Um, we have all kinds of programs uh, like that uh, in person, on video, and we have pro bono or a pro se where you get um, an attorney assigned to you if you can't afford one or you can help kind of write your own application. So all these resources, but most people did not know they existed. So really being in those you know, regions and getting the word out 
Those are really hubs of innovation, education, and outreach. And eventually, you can uh, come to those offices. You can search the same databases that our patent examiners search to see if somebody else did what you did, you've invented. You can have a face-to-face -face interview with your examiner via teleconferencing facility or if your examiner is there in person. So really bringing the full range of services out to the local innovation communities. And that doesn't even include what we do on the educational front with the schools teaching our kids about invention, about intellectual property, going into the elementary schools, going into the junior highs, going into the high schools, the colleges, right? Because we want all of our children to start thinking invention and entrepreneurship as early as possible. I would like nothing better than for all our kids wanting to grow up to be inventors. Not because it creates more business for us, but I think it's good for our economy and good for the health of our country. So really just being in our communities and being accessible um, is I think the value added of those regional offices. So I think it's a huge win for our country. So, I mean, this we're gonna have this probably on a national broadcast. So if, if any startups wanna know more about these regional offices, they'll go to USPTO.gov? Yeah, go to USPTO.gov and then there's a web page and it has all of our regional offices. But if you're out across the country and uh, the Alexandria, Virginia office is not your closest one, I would take a look at that website. I would see what programs are being offered because we routinely have workshops, programs for startups, for entrepreneurs, I mean, re on a whole variety of topics. How do you, how do you uh, use intellectual property as part of your business strategy and how do you develop, right, when should you start thinking about it? And I mean, all these issues that I would think any, any startup would want to know about. Okay, great, we'll definitely check that out. Um, remember, hashtag startup grind at USPTO. I want to talk from uh, talk about the telecommuting culture you have at the U.S. Patent Office. Um, just recently, MTV, uh, their winner for I think song of the year was uh, Fifth Harmony, which was Work from Home. So it's really popular, I think, in the minds of millennials. And so, um, U.S. Patent Office is actually the first organization in the federal government to um, implement a telecommuting culture. And in fact, 93 percent, 93 percent of your employees are eligible for. Uh, for telecommuting, and then two thirds already um, are at least telecommuting one to four days a week. So that's amazing, right? And so, like, uh, what should they do this for more of the federal agencies? And then, more importantly, could this even be possible for some of the Fortune 100 companies out there? Yeah. Well, I won't speak to the other branches of government because I think what we do at the United States Patent and Trademark Office much of it lends itself to the ability to be very, very, very productive, but in a telework environment. So our examiners, a lot of the time, they spend searching computer databases for what we call prior art references, what was done in the past, and they're writing their office actions and so forth. So a lot of what they do, or, or trademark examiners, right, a lot of what they do is, by nature, very conducive to teleworking. And um, so not everybody is eligible to telework. I don't think I am. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, I need to be there and that's fine. Um, but a lot of our positions are very, lend itself to being very, very productive and if not more productive in the telework environment. And I will say that our telework program has been a huge business advantage for our agency. If you think about it, we need to compete against the likes of the private sector, right? And I won't name the company's names, but you know, you, you know them all, right? And uh, we don't pay what they pay. However, our mission is very noble, right? Promote American innovation, support inventors. We get the most cutting edge technology anywhere, right? As soon as somebody invents something, they're filing for a patent. If you want to get a glimpse into what the future looks like in terms of technological innovation, guess what? We see a lot of it coming across our desks, our examiner's desks, on um, the cutting edge of technological innovation. And so interesting work, uh, flexible hours, right? Um, and not having to do the, 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 the mobile phone 24 by seven. There aren't very many jobs that allow for really interesting work, really great mission, flexibility in work, and if you can meet your production requirements, and we have pretty strict production requirements, and our work product is very measurable, it's a perfect kind of combination for the potential for telework. So we're very, our employees are quite very productive. And in fact, when there's government shutdown or when there's metro slowdown or partial shutdown, um, we're productive because we have a nationwide workforce. We can recruit technical talent across the country. We keep people longer and we're able to work with their 
situation so that we offer flexibility, interesting work, and noble mission. So it actually is a huge win for the agency because we can compete against the private sector for top technical talent. And we get really good people. Many of our people have PhDs. They have industry experience. Um, and in fact, in our regional offices, we are getting fantastic talent. I mean, th it's the first time that perhaps the government is hiring in those areas for technical talent. And I guess they like what the PTO has to offer, or they like the mission anyway. So that's interesting how you don't work from home. I mean, is there... I can't. <laughs> yeah, don't understand. I mean... I mean, for all those who are uh, who want to have a political career, career, I mean, would would they ever? There's no such thing as being appointed by the president and working from home. Well, I won't say no such thing ever, but um, yeah. I think it's important that I'm in the office as much as possible, and I. I I spend a lot of my days in meetings. Um, and, and now occasionally I will have a day where I read from home. And you know what? I am so productive when I'm able to work from home. I am more productive. That's what they oftentimes. all say, though, right? <laughs> it is, it, it, it's true for no, me. No, and I, yeah, no, no. yeah, but no. I mean, even in the, like, the snowdown, uh, yeah. excuse me, the government shutdown, our trademark examiners were at 106% productivity. That means more productive than when they're in the office. And you know, not to mention minimizing stress, and not to mention savings in real estate and environment and all this stuff, right? So it does require the ability to manage a workforce effectively. So we work very hard on that. We have state-of-the-art collaboration tools and all of that, but it's worked out for us. Um, I'd like to switch gears here uh, and talk about, so again, this is probably the most type of questions I would get from startups and startup founders especially when it comes to um, software. So I want to talk about patents for software. Um, there is there is a continuing debate, debate uh, between innovators and like, hey, should we uh, protect our algorithms, uh, their software, or should they go open source, or should they just like um, keep innovating and, and do it, make a trade secret? Like, what do you think is the best way for a startup to uh, protect their IP? And does, does it make a difference, yeah. um, depending what it is, software or hardware? So I was head of patents and patent strategy for my prior employer. And I did advise a lot of startup companies on their intellectual property strategy. And I mean, you're talking about software in particular. But what I will say is um, an intellectual property strategy has to be a piece of your business strategy. Now, it varies depending upon the technology sector that you're in. Um, if you're in the biotech pharmaceutical sector, you may be very heavily, very key patenting, you know, checking, making sure those things are airtight, rock solid. Um, but even if you're not, I mean, in, in the whole range of other industries, what your IP strategy should be depends upon a whole variety of factors, including your competitors, what they have, uh, where you think you will do business, both domestically and overseas, um, and your technology area. And in the area of software, what I will say is that software is patentable. Okay. Now, there have been a lot of rulings recently from the courts that have been narrowing the scope of patentability, um, but it is patentable. Now, whether you should or not, whether you should protect it with a patent, whether you should open source it, whether you should protect it via trade secrets or copyrights, I mean, each one of those forms of intellectual property protection has different advantages and disadvantages. Um, a, a trade secret is only good so long as it's kept a secret. A copyright only protects the particular expression that you've put, either you know, written or or or, or, or coded. And um, a patent is one of the stronger forms of intellectual property. But again, I'm not saying it's right for everybody. But you need to at least go through the analysis of what the various forms of intellectual property rights are, what your business model is, what your competitor, who your competitors are, what their strategies are, where you might like to go next in future incarnations of your products and services, and really think ahead. Because if you're not filing and you're not thinking about those things, then you're in essence making a decision. Right, because you could end up forfeiting some of those rights. So, whatever it is, all I'm saying is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not pro patent, anti patent, pro copyright. I mean, you need to do what's right for your business, but make an informed decision. So, one of the um, uh, the, the advantages of the regional offices is that we offer these kinds of programs, to kind of help step entrepreneurs through these things. Um, we also have an online intellectual property assessment tool 
where you can go online. I mean, your startup may have a number of things. It may have some code. It may have some, a, it certainly has a brand, right? You're going to want to protect your brand. You're going to want to register your mark to protect your brand. And what company doesn't have a brand? Um, but these are the kinds of things you can go online on, and using our IP assessment tool, you answer some questions and they can very basic, it can give you some brief overviews of what intellectual property assets you might have. You can make a business decision as to whether or not you want to protect it, and then you can get information about how to protect uh, whatever you wish to protect and in whatever format you wish to protect it in. I mean, eventually, right, if you will probably want to consult a lawyer, but this just helps you walk through some of the very basics um, so that you just can get a sense. But, you know, it should be concerted decision-making. It shouldn't be a... Uh, Although I, I do recognize, you know, with all the demands of the startup world and so forth, right, getting your 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 product to work and the new features launched, right, it oftentimes slips to the lower end of the list. But I would not leave it. Um, I would think about it proactively and, and at some d dedicate some resources to make sure that you're making smart decisions at the time. And you can always adjust, and you will need to adjust as your business strategy varies. But it's it's it, it needs to be a part of any well thought out business strategy. And it helps get funding too. So, so, so I want to delve maybe a little bit more into that because I just, you know, just hearing chatter from this the conversation you were having with some of the startups, you know, they were saying, you know, I have the startup idea, you know, when should I, when first of all, when should I like launch my idea, and then when should I patent it, right? And like, I know it's a very generic question, but like, do you have any sort of guidelines? You know, I, I'm a startup, I have a marketplace. I mean, is that even patentable? And uh, sh when should I start patenting? If, it, if maybe it's an algorithm that's, uh, that's, that's um, important for the, the way, it, the mechanism of the startup? I, mean, I don't know, like, when, when do you think we should start patenting? So earlier is always better, right? You need to know information before you take action that could cause you to forfeit certain of your rights. And um, the laws are such that, in some sense, if you've sold or if you made your certain things available to the public, um, you are precluded from getting foreign rights. So in this day and age, what company is not thinking global from day one? especially when you can just as easily have your first sale over the internet in Beijing as in Boston, right? So you really need to start thinking global from day one. And if you're going to launch it, I mean, I, I would definitely make sure that you've got whatever protections in place before you do so. So that's number one is uh, um, think think about it early and make be, before you make mis take actions that could preclude you from, from getting the full benefit of your rights. And then again, right? Once you have a sense of what you've got and what you want to protect in light of your business strategy, you don't have to patent everything under the sun, but you can make choices. You can prioritize um, and you can have a list. Okay, first I'm doing this, then I'm doing this, then I want to protect this by trade secret and I want to protect this by some other form, right? So, but have a holistic strategy from the start and everything's not going to be top priority, nor will your budget permit everything to be top priority, but also know that um, we offer a small entity discounts at 50% off of rack rate. And if you're a micro entity, you get 75% off of rates. So really pricing, you know, people think, oh, it's so expensive and it's so hard. And right, right. No, it, well, price, our filing fees, like I said, if you qualify for small entity status and many startups do, or micro entity status, you get anywhere from 50% off to 75% off. Also with regard to the lawyers, if you are under-resourced as an inventor, in other words, don't have enough funds for a lawyer, we can help assign you a lawyer for free. Or if you decide, you know what, I don't qualify as an under-resourced inventor, but I want to save some money, and I actually think I'd like to write my own patent application, we've got a dedicated team at the PTO who can help provide more guidance for you and handhold you through the process. So again, the barriers to entry should not be that I don't have enough money or it's too expensive the filing fees are too expensive because we want those startups to come into the system and benefit. Everybody should have access to our intellectual property system. And we hope one day that you all grow up to be big companies, that you pay file patents and, or, or trademarks or whatever it is, and, and that uh, you're paying full rates. But you know what? The most important thing is that you guys have access to the system to meet your business goals, not just filing for the sake of filing, but to meet your business goals, maybe to get venture capital funding, maybe to get a customer or, or whatever it is, create value in your company. Um, and uh, so again, that's, you know, these are the kinds of resources that I think a lot of people don't realize that the United States Patent and Trademark Office offers. 
but it does. So come by, talk to us, um, come visit our regional offices and find out what the range of services we are and you be the judge as to what you need for your business, but make it a smart and informed decision. That's amazing. I had no idea you guys had sort of a equivalent pu a public defender uh, patent officer, right? I mean, that's a yeah. If you're under resourced, we can help we, hook you up. And also, we have uh, we have programs with law students who are supervised by law professors who help advise startup companies. It's a good experience for the law students, and they're supervised. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of ranges and options. It depends on your comfort level, of course. Um, but there are options. So, um, the fact that it's too expensive or I can't afford um, you know, I mean, maybe that means you have to prioritize and you're not filing all of what you wish. But I mean, again, have a strategy and um, be aware of what resources are offered. And we got a lot of stuff online. We have a trademark video that goes through the basics of how to register for a trademark. Right. And then we've got videos on, uh, you know, uh, filing for patents and the steps and processes involved. So just be more informed about it and learn about it, and, and uh, but it really should be available to everybody, and it, it, that's our goal is to make it available to everybody. Yeah. Uh, no, that's that's just really amazing. I mean, I, this is the first time I'm hearing about this, and it's awesome because I because there's a lot, of, especially the startups that have their engineer focus, mm -hmm. so they want to do everything themselves. It's like, no, no, I'm going to write my own patent, and it's like, uh, I don't know if you want to do that, and, and it's it's amazing that you have resources yeah. to help complement them, I guess. Let's you know without hurting their egos, so. That's 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 amazing. I wanted to kind of switch gears again um, and talk about uh, so the whole disruptors in the market here, and you know when they're introducing products and business models and delivery mechanisms, um, there are some pressures uh, on these disruptive technology. The pressures on these um, this disruptive technology is somewhat government related, um, and so what could we do? Um, as entrepreneurs to ease these pressures um, and create an environment that be beneficial for every, everybody, right? So, so um, if you stop and think about it, our most disruptive technologies and business models are probably more likely than not to run up against and test the existing laws and regulations and policies that were designed for a world in which they did not live. So the more disruptive, the more hurdles you're going to face in that front. And I mean, this is not really an area core to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, but having come from the Silicon Valley, having worked for a company and companies that were very, very disruptive, having helped them navigate that landscape so that they had the chance to succeed. I've seen this and I've experienced it. And what I would say is um, the more disruptive your technology, the more disruptive your business model, the more forward thinking you have to be in terms of your outreach and engagement. Uh, with um, policymakers, legislators, and regulators, because um, now and now that I'm in Washington, I understand that these folks do want all of you to succeed. But unless you're talking to them, and this was true in the early days at Google, unless you're talking to them, they don't understand what your business needs are. So having those relationships, speaking to them early, and I get right, you got lots of things to do. You got your code to launch. You got your product to get out the door. Right, you probably don't have a governmental affairs person. All those issues, right? They're just pragmatic reality. But start thinking about affiliating yourself with and collaborating with your competitors who share similar legislative, regulatory, and policy goals. You can compete, compete fiercely on the, um, you know, on, on the engineering talent, on the product features and functionality. But at least with regard to policy and regulations and trying to influence that and educate Washington or your state uh, regulators or the local, there are opportunities to collaborate and you have a shared goal, which is to create an environment in which these super disruptive uh, technologies or business models can survive and thrive. Whether that's the shared economy type models, whether that's driverless cars, drones, I mean, you name it. I mean, there will be a lot of legal, regulatory, and policy issues that will have to be sorted through, and you don't have to fight that single-handedly, but be smart about it. Collaborate with others who share your goals. You can compete on other fronts, but this might not be one of the areas where you decide not to collaborate, shall I say. We definitely see that trend where you see the Ubers and Airbnbs of the world. Um, it's almost like they want to disrupt and ask for, uh, they, they, they'll disrupt and ask for permission later. And um, I've heard in the Valley, like, you know, maybe that's not the best way to do things or approach, uh, but, you know, the Valley is the Valley, right? Uh, they're going to do what they want to do. 
Um, and so just even recently with like, you know, you'll see Senator Warner, um, he's, he was talking about the, the classification of, of workers and, and, you know, how can we protect, um, you know, the, w, the W-2s and the contractors and there's one in, in, in between. And it's like the, the it's these policymakers are sort of like playing catch up, you know, and so so I guess you know we're you know we're we're just we're startups and we're just busy trying to run our startups. Like like how soon do we have to engage and how do we engage? Like do we call up our congressman and say, hey, this is what I'm working on? Or I mean, how do we engage? You know, with the policymakers. So I get it, right? There, there are a lot of de- competing demands on your time, and um, what I would say is that's why I think. You shouldn't try to do it single-handedly, especially when you're so lean on your resources. I mean, you've got a choice to hire an engineer versus a governmental affairs person. We're probably going to hire that engineer first, but don't. I mean, don't fight this battle on your own. There are industry associations with uh, companies just like you who share your goals, right? Who want to educate Washington, Washington, or government. I say that in loosely meaning government. They do want to understand what your needs are because their success depends upon your success, and your success depends upon their success. So, engaging early and often to the extent that your um, resources permit and time permits, um, sharing with them your vision and and right. I mean, bring them along. Don't wait until you've already launched it and then they're coming down on you and you've got that oops moment where, right, you didn't check any of the boxes and all of a sudden you got an issue on hand. That's the wrong time to be educating them about your product or service, right? You want to bring them along. I mean, like anything else in life, right? You want to be friends with somebody before you actually need something from them and you want them to understand what you're trying to achieve, right? Before you get to the point where they're thinking, what are you doing? How did you ever think you could do that, right? You want to bring them along with you to the extent that that's possible. And again, it doesn't need to be single-handedly. It can be as an industry with your competitors, right? Or what have you. But there there are definitely advantages to doing that early and often as much as resources and time can permit. So just kind of giving you guys uh, some sneak peek from Startup Grind. We're actually trying to figure out how to create a Startup Grind policy conference here in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. and invite all the disruptors in the Valley to come here in the backyards. And then, I mean, we've had uh, past guests, Congressman um, Daryl Issa and, and Jared Polis and, um, and all the other uh, entrepreneur mm-hmm. Congress congressmen. Congresswoman, so uh, hopefully you can join us if um, we can get it in time. Sounds like a great idea, and I think that's that would be a very productive conversation. So we'll do that. I wanted to, as we're, uh, I'm gonna wrapping up these questions, and I'll try to open up the Q and A. So, under the Obama administration, uh, what do you think is your proudest achievements achievement in the U.S. Patent Office? Oh, I have. It's been a, it's been a pleasure and an honor to serve in this role. And what I'm a couple of things I'm most proud of is um, well I got to give you a couple because you can't um, opening those regional offices. I came to the Patent and Trademark Office. This was not my first job. I came because uh, I was invited to be the first director of the Silicon Valley regional office. And having been born and raised in the Silicon Valley, I immediately saw the value of that office to not just the Silicon Valley, which I knew it would be a huge, huge, major contributing factor to, but the whole West Coast region. So I always said if I could help stand up that office, I could point to that office and say to my daughter, you know, your mother had a hand in opening that office, and that would be my big contribution to the world. And I'm still very proud of those offices. So to have four of those offices open up across the country for our young inventors, for our older inventors, for our entrepreneurs, I think nothing but upside. So that's number one. Number two is because I come from uh, Silicon Valley and tech, and I come from a company that is arguably one of the companies with the biggest amount of data and does a lot of big data work, um, I've brought that method to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, an agency that is 200 plus years old, right? And so now um, when we our examiners make a lot of tough decisions, technical and legal, on what is patent eligible, and they're re- they're they're really judgment calls. Uh, some cases are they're clearer, in other cases they're not. And um, but they're, it's a tough job. And so what I've done is now we're now using and we're beginning to use big data analytic techniques. So we've got about um, 600,000 patent filings per year. We've got 8,400 examiners. And we've got about a million patent applications pending and open at any given time. So they're processing all these applications, all your hard work, right? Creating lots of these applications in our office. But now we're really electronically recording and we're going to begin to measure them and we're going to generate three to five times more data about the accuracy of their examination. Folding that back into their training so that we can more precisely identify by technology unit, by art unit, 
you know, where there's perhaps outlying behavior, just as any businesses, you know, businesses these days are using big data to help refine and improve the products of their products and services. We're doing no differently. So that's another thing that I'm very proud of. And also opening up all of, all of our data. If you think about it, the USPTO has, as I said, it's an early telltale sign of the direction in which innovation is going. Now, in the past, you could look at it on a patent by patent basis. That's not very helpful. But what we've created now is a, a data visualization tool where you can pull together a bunch of information. You do a word search. You can find out where across the globe activity in certain technology areas is occurring, by whom, by academia, by what company. And then you overlay on top of that perhaps funding information or demographic information. And all of a sudden, you have a very, very powerful tool on the competitive landscape, who's doing what, where, who you need to collaborate with, and unleashing the power of that data in an open data-like format is very powerful and never been done. So that's another issue I'm, uh, matter I'm very proud of. And last but not least is um, I am the first woman to serve in this role. Um, and so one of my proudest moment was that uh, initiatives was that um, with Invent Now, we helped create a Girl Scout patch on intellectual property. And if the girls learn a little bit about patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, and they exercise their inventive, creative energies, then they get to earn a patch on intellectual property. And I was a Girl Scout, both a brownie and a junior, and the patches that I remember learning about or, or earning were on first aid and sewing. And I just think in our modern day economy, right, if we really want to give our girls the skills they need to succeed, they need to know a little bit about invention and intellectual property. So I was in Southeast, I think DC, and I was with Secretary Pritzker, and these, I think must have been second grade uh, little girls had earned their IP patch. And I, we had the privilege of giving them their, their, uh, their patch, and they were so proud. And they showed us their invention, and they showed us the basic sketch of their patent. And I thought, you know what? This is what this job is. I mean, this is really about incentivizing and um, uh, the next generation to be inventors so that our country can continue to thrive and flourish. So that's my other. Actually, I wanted to go into that, actually, uh, women in technology and STEM. Um, you, you had said in the past that at the patent office, um, there's only been, and I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, it's only been the past three years of patent filing, only 15% have been women. No, no, worse no? than that. It's worse <laughs> so than that? You, okay, if you look at the past 30 years, yeah. the percentage of patents granted to women who, you know, one woman's name listed on a US-based uh, uh, patent, uh, about 15% of them have one woman mentioned in the list of inventors for US-based inventors. And if you think about it, 15%, that's pretty low. That is pretty low. And the projection is if we continue at our current rate, it will take another 140 years before we reach parity. And you know, the question is, right, in this day and age when we cannot hire enough technical talent and we're asking Congress to change our immigration laws uh, so that companies can meet all their needs. And if you look ahead, if you think ahead, the highest projected job growth oftentimes in these areas that require STEM background and computer science, IT, um, and those are some of the highest paying jobs, right? If we can't even fill those jobs with our current homegrown talent, you know, why should we not, why shouldn't we be nurturing all of our talent? And so it's not just an issue of girls versus boys. I say that across all of our demographics. I mean, I don't want the innovation just to occur on the West Coast and the East Coast. What about the middle of our country? What about people from different demographic backgrounds, right? We should really be harnessing and developing all of our STEM talent um, because you never know who's going to come up with that next great invention or who's going to be the entrepreneur that starts that next company that's going to really cre create a tremendous amount of economic opportunity for our country. You just, you can never tell, predict those things. And so if we're not developing all of our talent, and that's one of the issues that I feel very strongly about, um, we're, it, I think it's a matter of economic imperative as well as social. We need to do it for uh, continued competitiveness in a very increasingly globally competitive environment. Do you think it should start off like at the home first and then the schools? I mean, how, how do we get women to be more into, uh, you know, I've finally, you know, we wanted to get 50, 50, 50, 50 yeah. percent, you know, parity, right? Of, it's, of patent filing, right? So women's, boys, across all demographics, I think you need to tackle it through all angles. Um, it cannot just be the textbook learning of science. It has to be that passion, that excitement for creating something new, right? What, I mean, you guys created things, right? So what, if you didn't 
get, get that energy from because you read something in the textbook. So what the PTO has uh, launched is uh, and worked together with Invent Now is a program called Camp Invention. And it's a one week summer enrichment program where elementary school age kids can come for one week and they learn a little bit about they go into a room and literally there's a pile full of stuff, low cost stuff, right? Motors, w wires, batteries, wheels, balsa wood, and then they're given a design project, build a pinball machine. So these little elementary school age kids go in there, they get all their stuff, and then they have to like sketch out, design, prototype, build, test, redesign, right? And But you should see the level of excitement about their ability to make and create something and they're learning STEM skills. It's just not textbook STEM skills. So really, they need it from the homes. They need it from their teachers. They need it in these kinds of activities that are hands-on, practical, uh, all of that. And then it needs to stay with them all throughout the years. Oftentimes, you'll see various groups dropping off along the way. And I was, I'm a woman in STEM, and I did find that there were fewer and fewer women the higher I went up in math, science, and engineering, not to mention law and other things. So it really, you need support all along the way, and you need role models all along the way, and all of those factors uh, determine who ends up inventing, starting companies, and creating new products and services. We'll open up the floor for Q&A. Do we have a question? Diego? OK. Do you have a question? Hi. Um, regarding how how innovation is approaching, I, I was uh, studying my PhD, and I noticed that um, as a foreign, that there's not many Americans uh, studying anymore. You know, so there's at, at least at that level. You know, there's I I find it very hard also as as a foreign how the laws are to. Uh, establish and create a company here in the United States, and I don't know how it is with the patent uh, intellectual property and that for foreigns. Um, so, what's the question? What was the question? <laughs> well, I mean, are, are, how are the are the policies different for helping foreigns? Uh, yeah. Develop pat patents. So the beauty about our patent system is that it's completely age blind, race blind, you know, I mean, all we, we ask for your name and your address. And so if you think about it, there are very few things in life that don't have an age requirement. To drive, there's an age requirement. To vote, there's an age requirement. To drink, there's an age requirement in right throughout most of the United States. But to file and obtain a patent, there's no age requirement. And if you think about it, our youngsters are some of the most creative. Why does it have to be this way? Why can't I do it that way? But yet, as people get older and older, that sort of curiosity, that natural curiosity sort of somehow gets pounded out of you, and then you, you end up kind of conforming. But why shouldn't we be nurturing our kids, that, that natural talent, that innate curiosity that they have, to get them to think about different ways, better ways of doing things and making things? So I would love to see more kids, and we do have kids, minors, who file for patents. Right? But why shouldn't all of our kids be thinking, I can do that. I want to grow up to be an inventor. Why does it have to be that way? And I can create something better and different. Because you know what? Chances are, if they put their head to it, they might be able to do it. So there's no difference in terms of age treatment. There's, as far as um, applicants, from whatever, we don't even ask for what country. Well, I think you have to put address information, but we issue uh, patents to foreigners. I mean, if you think about it, um, inventors and companies all across the globe, because the United States is such an important marketplace, Many of them are filing at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So we get a lot of foreign applicants, and we treat them all the same. OK, we got a question for two more. OK, there's, all right, so how many patents have you filed? OK, are you going to? OK, wait, wait, hold on. Are you going to file one? You going to do a trademark? How about you? You going to do one? You are working on one? How about you? So how many? <laughs> I only have two questions. I can only do two. Are you gonna do two? Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to patent my question anyway, so no problem. <laughs> um, so how do we know that an idea that we have is mature enough to be patent? Um, so it varies a lot by technology area, um, but you have to. It has to be new, useful, and non-obvious. And your description has to be enabling. That means you have to be able to teach somebody of ordinary skill in the art 
how to do it. So if you're missing key pieces that do not that prevents enabling somebody of ordinary skill in the art, you probably need to go back to the drawing board and work on it a little more. So these are tough legal determinations and judgment calls. What I would say is, um, you know, look at our materials online. You can come. We have an inventor assistance program, a uh, num telephone number. We have um, a whole bunch of resources like that. And also, you can talk to a lawyer, right, and get your, I mean, run through what you've got and see if there's enough there. But, you know, at what point do you have enough? It varies a lot by industry and what your invention is. And let me give you also a couple. There was the inventor assistance hotline that you can call. Um, and there's... Um, inventor assistance program that we also have and we also have an office in Alexandria Virginia where you can walk in as well now um, you know depending upon the complexity and so forth you may eventually want to talk to a, a legal expert either pro bono or, or or paid for but that's the kind of thing where I mean it, there's some judgment call there but um, there are legal standards and you do have to be above that threshold in order to um, get a patent one more question. I'll get it to this guy. Hi, my name's Samson. Hi. You, um, you said that there were some um, rookie mistakes that people would make that disqualifies them for a, for a patent. Can you give us like a common example of what some of those mistakes are? Uh, yeah, if you sell your product um, and uh, that could preclude rights overseas. So if you wanted to enter a foreign market, um, selling it is a big triggering point you may want to have your patent rights uh, lined up uh, before you sell, or fi if filed, on file, anyway. And one other point on the international space uh, uh, front, I mean, the it whole international realm is a whole other, I mean, it varies a lot by country, and it's not all equally um, friendly or protective, but we also have what we call IP attaches. So if you're interested in foreign countries, I know you're all startups, so this is like way down the road, perhaps, but. I mean, it's a global market, so you can. T we have experts on the ground who can help U.S. companies navigate the intellectual property landscape overseas. So, if you want to sell your product in in uh, uh, China or India, right, and you're thinking, "Oh my goodness, what it, what should I be doing? What should I be prepared for? What should I be careful of?" We have experts who can kind of help step you through some of that. Uh, it's on our website, but um, I can have one of my staff members follow up more specifically with you on the IP attaché program. But that's an incredibly valuable resource because, I mean, even big companies take advantage of that. I mean, it's a tremendous, it's hard, the foreign, foreign jurisdictions and foreign environments vary a lot. And we will, we'll actually put a reference in there in our um, post event write up. We'll talk about that. Fair so enough. We'll, um, so, two last questions because, you know, I'm the interviewer. I got to ask. Me two questions. Um, so number one, and uh, I'll get to the second one, but what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge um, in IP in the future, even after you leave the U.S. Patent Office? I think it's along the lines of what we just discussed. Um, this, the economy is increasingly global, and as I said, with the internet, you can just as easily have sales for sales in Beijing as in Boston. So. Even startups need to start thinking international from day one. I mean, in the past, you sort of entered the United States first, and right. but now that you have the internet, I mean, it really is a global market. So how do you navigate that? And when you sell your products and services overseas, is there a respect for your intellectual property rights that is in your technology? Uh, or will it get stolen and copied with little or no consequences? So one of the things that I spend a lot of t my time on is worrying about and trying to encourage other countries to share our IP values, our intellectual property values, making sure that there are appropriate enforcement mechanisms and appropriate damages and remedies to discourage misappropriation. I want all of our companies across the globe, not just American companies, for their products to compete on the merits of the product, to have a level playing field so that everybody could sell wherever they want, right? But it's the merit of the product that determines who sells the most, not preferential treatment for a domestic industry or domestic provider over another. And I think if all the countries do that and they can work together to do that, then you will see the best products and services rise to the marketplace and it incentivizes innovation. And so the last question I have, it's probably the most important question. I always ask all of our guests this question. Okay. So you ready for this? So who is your favorite superhero? Okay. 
or historical figure and why? My favorite superhero? Wonder Woman, of course. <laughs> oh, but do you have a historical figure? Oh, there's so and, many, and, but I think... Uh, and, and why? And why? Well, I think uh, Gandhi has to be at the very top. I mean, just a lot of respect for what he achieved and the manner in which he achieved it. Okay, so obviously you told me the answer of your superhero, and um, we have here <laughs> Superwoman. <laughs> Somebody Start told ride. you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can carry it. Uh, I don't know. Do you, do you need help walking to your car with this? I think I'm <laughs> good, I think but, but I'm honored. <laughs> Somebody clearly told you the answer to my question. <laughs> <laughs> ladies, and ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Lee. Thank you. Director Michelle Lee, thank you thank very you. much for coming up. Thank, thank you. you.